Well, good evening, everyone, um, and thank you. Do you want me to put it in full screen mode, or what are you seeing? Uh, right now, it's still black. It says Is that better? screen sharing. Now we get it. Yes, now we got it. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. And I've been asked to talk with you about beneficial insects and um, integrated pest management and how you can apply those concepts um, in your own backyard or in your communities. So let's see. Today, I wanted to really briefly give you an overview of what is integrated pest management, but really spend most of our time kind of highlighting some of the beneficial insects. And typically when I use the term beneficial insects, I include pollinators. But since I heard you guys already had a great talk on pollinators, today I'm gonna to focus on two groups that typically refer, we refer to as natural enemies. And those are our predators and our parasitoids. So I'm gonna highlight some important predators and parasitoids that you guys will hopefully see and can conserve in your backyard. So, Integrated, integrated pest management is an approach that uses physical, mechanical, biological, as well as chemical controls to suppress pests. Today, we are going to focus on those biological control methods to suppressing pests um, in an urban landscape, specifically your backyard. So what is biological control? Biological control is using living organisms to suppress pest populations, typically below an economically um, damaging or unacceptable aesthetic level. So when it's your backyard, you're usually worried about aesthetics. You're not as much concerned about the economics as, as a farmer might be. And when we're thinking about biological control, there's three groups of biological control. There's classical, also sometimes called importation. And this is usually a, a program that our federal government will spearhead. Um, it's when we have an invasive pest that has come in um, from another country, and they will go to that country of origin and look for um, parasitoids and predators to rear and then release to control that invasive pest species. So we're not going to talk about that one today. The second type of biological control is called augmentation biological control. And this is where you can actually release a very large number of natural enemies, either predators or parasitoids, into a landscape to, to try to suppress a pest. Um, and I'm going to highlight um, when you potentially have the opportunities to do that in your own backyard with some of the species we're going to talk about today. But what I really want to focus on today is conservation biological control. And conservation biological control is when we manipulate the habitat to favor existing natural enemies. So those existing predators and parasitoids that are already in the landscape and hopefully in your backyard, and we just want to increase their numbers so they can help provide um, pest suppression services. Um, and some of the main ways that we can um, perform conservation biological control in your backyard is providing resources like pollen and nectar for our natural enemies, providing alternative prey sources, um, providing overwintering habitats, minimizing our chemical exposure and chemical use, and in some cases, as we're going to talk about with our beetles, we really want to be mindful of tilling and disturbing the soil. So just some quick facts and figures about biological control. Um, these are a little outdated, but they're still, I think, fairly impressive. So as of 2006, the value of natural pest suppression services in the U.S. was $4.5 billion. So the work that these very small um, insect predators and parasitoids are doing um, contributes substantially to especially our agricultural industry. Um, we have 60 to 70 insect and spider families that provide um, that are natural enemies and provide biological control services. And just a reminder, when I say the word natural enemy, I'm talking about predators and parasitoids. Um, two examples are our lady beetles. Sometimes people call them ladybugs. We have 400 different species of ladybugs in the US and over 2000 species of braconid wasps. And I'm gonna go through right now who some of these beneficial insects are. So when you see them in your yard, you'll know um, to protect them and try to augment them because they're doing good work for you. So the first group I wanna highlight are the group of praying mantises. So most people have probably seen a praying mantis. Um, they are a predaceous insect. 
Um, and they are predaceous in both the adult and immature stage or the nymph stage. Um, just to remind you, this group of insects undergoes what we call incomplete metamorphosis. So if you remember back to like seventh grade biology, that's where you have an egg, a nymph, an adult. And those nymphal stages, every time the insect molts, it gets a little bigger, but all the stages look alike, unlike complete metamorphosis, which is like what a butterfly goes through, where the adult stage and immature stages look very different. Um, some of you may have seen the, this lower picture is a picture of the praying mantis, praying mantis egg case. So some of you may have actually seen um, the egg case in your backyard. So I just wanted to show you a picture of what that looks like. It kind of looks a little foamy um, in its texture and uh, light brown in its color. So praying okay. mantises are opportunistic, um, meaning they're very, uh, a very generalist uh, predator. So they'll eat pest insects as well as sometimes um, beneficial insects in the landscape. So the next group, um, and Jared, I forgot to check my time when I started. So if I start to go a little over, you'll just have to give me like maybe a, a warning when I have like five or 10 minutes left so I can uh, kind of gauge my time. Um, Cause you, I guys, I can go on a long time about, uh, about insects, which you probably don't want to hear too much about insects on your Sunday evening. So the next group of uh, predators I wanted to talk with you about are called big eyed bugs. And you can kind of see in this photo, this insect actually has really big eyes, which is how it got its common name. Um, it's predaceous in both the adult and immature stage. Um, its hosts are insect pests like spider mites, scales, white flies, and chinch bugs. Um, a really common species is called Geophorus or the big eyed bug. And this uh, insect can eat 1600 spider mites to develop or about um, 80 insects per day as an adult. So a pretty impressive predator. Um, the next group of insects I'm sure you guys have all seen in your backyards, they're called the assassin bugs and ambush bugs. Um, and so in the lower right hand corner, that's a picture of an ambush bug, uh, another really wonderful predator. They're predaceous as, as both immature insects as well as adults. Um, they like to feed on insects like aphids, um, I have a picture of a leaf hopper in the upper right hand corner, which is a host, caterpillars, beetle eggs, um, and psyllids. So keep an eye out for this uh, predator in your backyard. The next predator I want to highlight for you guys is a very, very small insect called minute pirate bugs. It's black and white in color. Um, they're about one to two millimeters in length, so pretty easy to overlook. Um, but they are really voracious predators and great to have in the landscape. They're predaceous, again, as immature insects as well as adults. And they feed on, again, aph um, insects like aphids, thrips, small caterpillars, mites, and other insect eggs. Um, aureus, which is uh, a genera of this group of bug insects, can destroy about 15% of corn earworm eggs relatively quickly. And it can eat about 30 plus spider mites in a day. So again, um, a really good predator to have in the landscape. And when I was going through the types of biological control in the beginning, we talked about augmentation biological control. And this is where you could release large numbers of insects into the landscape to help um, suppress a particular pest. So this is an example of an insect that's available commercially, and you could actually buy this insect and you could release it into your landscape if you had a particular insect pest that you're wanting to control. So with, one thing I would uh, remind everyone of is when you are going to commercially buy a natural enemy to make sure you're buying a species that's appropriate for your region of the country. So another group of bugs um, that are predaceous are called damsel bugs. You can see in this, um, the insect predator, it has a piercing sucking mouth part. I don't know if you guys can see my cursor, but you can see that his mouth part is kind of a long beak and it's um, basically sucking the inside of its uh, prey out. And that's how this insect kills or kills pest species by using a piercing sucking mouth part. We have about 34 species of these insects in um, North America. 
They are predaceous, again, as both adults and immature stages on insects like aphids, leafhoppers, and caterpillars. Moth eggs um, are some of its favorite um, pests to feed on. So the next group of predators are our beetles. And we have a lot of beetles that are very good um, predators in the landscape. And the first group are called crabid beetles. Um, we have over 2,000 species of crabid beetles in the US and Canada. Um, again, this group of insects are predaceous in the larval stage as well as the adult stage. Um, many of these beetles are going to be found in the soil. A lot of times that's where they're developing um, as larvae as well as just hanging out as adults. So this is um, one example of a group of natural enemies where you'd want to be careful if you're trying to conserve crabbed beetles not to disturb the soil because that's where they're hanging out. Um, and a lot of times that's where they're going to be, um, have their larval stage and laying eggs as well. So another group of beetles that I'm sure everyone is familiar with are the lady beetles or ladybugs. We have over 400 species of lady beetles and ladybugs in the US and Canada. Um, they range in size from two to eight millimeters, so fairly small. Um, again, this is another group that's predaceous in the larval stage as well as the adult stage. So it's really great when we have a, a predator that is predaceous in multiple life stages. So that just means that we're getting kind of extra services out of that group of insects. Some insects, as we'll see, are just going to provide that biological control service in one life stage. So ladybugs um, love feeding on insects like aphids and scales and mealybugs and white flies, all very common pests that you can find in your garden. Um, there's Most of the time, lady beetles are generalists, meaning they'll feed on a you know, a wide range of insect pests, but there's a couple that are also specialized on pests like mealybugs and spider mites. Adult lady beetles, a lot of times you guys will probably see them on flowers, and that's because they also will feed on nectar and pollen. So when I talked about at the beginning, being able to provide floral resources in your garden to support um, a lot of these natural enemies, this is one group that will really go and supplement their diet with pollen and nectar. This group also um, having overwintering habitat like leaf litter or your perennial flower, flower beds, leaving that habitat for this species to overwinter in is also very important to having a persistent population from year to year. Um, and as an example, they can consume about 500 to 1,000 aphids during development. So again, a really a wonderful predator to have in the landscape. There are um, some lady beetles that are commercially available. Um, here's just a list of um, some of those species that you can buy commercially. There's one species, um, Hippodamia convergence, that I would caution against um, purchasing this species because it tends to disperse very, fairly rapidly. So you, if you buy this species and release it in your garden, it doesn't tend to stick around in your garden for very long because it'll disperse. So be careful with purchasing that one. Um, Okay, and here are just some pictures of some native ladybugs as well as exotic lady beetles um, that you may have in your landscape. So we do have some exotic lady beetles that were actually introduced as a result of classical biological control. So we had an invasive pest and these species were released to try to control that invasive pest and they've now um, established in the landscape. But we also have a lot of nati native lady beetles most of the time, they're your classic kind of black and red and black or orange and black or pink, but there are some unique lady bugs that are different colors like black and kind of this ashy gray, which is a tannish color. And I also yeah. wanted to point out on this slide what the immature stage of this insect looks like. Um, it's here in the bottom right-hand corner. So typically they're gonna be black and orange um, and so if you see this immature stage, this is what the immature stage of a lady beetle looks like. So be sure um, not to accidentally crush or think that's a pest in your garden. That's actually an immature lady beetle.
So this is one of my uh, favorite um, predators. This is called a green lacewing. There's also a brown lacewing. We have about 90 species in North America and Canada, um, mostly predaceous in the larval stage. Some adults are predaceous, but it's really the larval stage that's providing those beneficial insect services for us. Um, green lacewing larvae, um, and the larvae is this lower picture down here. You can see it has kind of a sickle shaped mouth part really likes feeding on aphids, mites, thrips, white flies, mealybugs, and small caterpillars. Um, the adults will oftentimes visit and feed on pollen and honeydew. So again, really important to have other resources in your garden for the adult stage of this natural enemy. Um, I'm gonna go to the next uh, slide because it shows all the stages, uh, life stages of this insect. So the upper um, left is the adult stage, you know, very lacy wings. I just showed you the picture of the larval stage, oftentimes called an ant lion with those very sickle shaped mouth parts. But the other stage I wanted to point out is what the eggs look like. Um, and you guys have probably seen them if you've been looking closely at your, the leaves, the underside of your leaves in your garden. When I see these eggs, they kind of remind me of an upside down balloon. Um, so here's the egg and it's on this long stalk. And if you um, see these little eggs on the underside of your leaves, those are the eggs of the green lacewing. So be sure to leave those um, in your landscape. So hoverflies, another really important predator to have in the landscape. The adult um, is the lower picture and the Larval stage is the upper picture. For this fly, we have about 870 species in North America, and it's the larval stage that does all the work for us. So the larval stage is predaceous on insects like aphids and small caterpillars and scale. The adult stage exclusively feeds on nectar and pollen. So again, this is another insect group that it's really important to have floral resources in your garden or in your landscape to be able to support this um, beneficial insect. The larval stage can eat about 400 aphids during its development. So it can really help suppress um, aphids in your landscape. So I'm gonna switch gears. We just spent a lot of time going over some really common um, you know, predator species you can find in your landscape. But the other really important group of natural enemies you can find in your garden is, is parasitoids. So I wanted to introduce you to parasitoids and let you know how um, effective they are in providing a pest suppression as well. So parasitoids are in the group Hymenoptera. That's the second most diverse insect order after the beetles. Um, we have about 18,000 species in the U.S. and Canada, and they include the ants, wasps, and bees. And parasitoids are very small wasp species of wasps. Um, they undergo complete metamorphosis, so egg, larva, pupa, and adult. Um, and it's the larval stage that's predaceous. Um, so it's the larval stage that's providing the pest suppression services for us. The adults feed on nectar. Um, so again, another group that's really important to have those floral resources in your landscape to support um, parasitic hymenoptera. Um, the most kind of frequent host of parasitoids are caterpillars, beetle larvae, scale, aphids, and sawflies. But depending on the species, they um, can attack any stage of a pest from the adult to the egg, to the pupa, to the larva. And I'm gonna have some pictures for you guys um, as we go through some of the parasitic hymenoptera groups of parasitoids that are attacking different life stages. Um, so really quickly, we have two different types of parasitoids. We have parasitoids that are called internal parasitoids, which means the adult will lay its egg inside the host and the larvae will develop inside the host, basically feeding on that host and eventually killing it as it develops. Um, and then we have what are called external parasitoids. And this caterpillar, this um, tomato hornworm, has external parasitoids that are developing. They're still feeding on that caterpillar, but they're developing externally. Um, so this egg up here, um, what's well, not an egg, I'm sorry, it's a scale. 
and you can see the um, exit hole of the parasitoid that has developed inside that scale and emerged, leaving that little hole. So if you happen to have scale on any of your trees and you notice little tiny holes um, in your scale, that means that that scale was killed by a parasitoid and that parasitoid has emerged, leaving that very small exit hole. And this bottom middle picture are pictures of aphids. And you'll notice one aphid looks normal. It's green in color. And we have three aphids that are kind of puffy, kind of bloated looking, and they've turned brown. And these are called mummies. Um, and these have a parasitoid developing internally. They've killed that aphid. And soon an adult parasitoid will emerge from that aphid that has been killed um, by the larvae feeding internally. So I'm just gonna go through and show you some pictures of what some of these parasitoids look like and who they are. The first group are called Verconid wasps. So we have over 2000 species in North America. Um, they can range in size from being quite small to, to pretty large um, parasitoids. They oftentimes are attacking insects like caterpillars, wood boring beetles, sawflies, and leaf miners. There's a couple very large um, Burkhanid and Nicumonid wasps that will actually drill through wood to find beetle larvae that are inside a tree. Um, so that's pretty impressive and pretty cool. So they'll drill through the wood to lay their hole in the beetle larva, um, killing that beetle larva that's inside uh, the tree. They are both internal and external parasitoids in this group, um, and they are a very important group for agriculture and forest pests. As I mentioned, those um, parasitoids that can drill through wood to attack oftentimes forest pests. And some species are commercially available. Ichumonid wasps look very, very similar to Gerberconid wasps. Um, oftentimes, you actually have to look at them under the microscope at their wing venation to be able to tell them apart. But we have over 4,700 species of Achaemonid wasps in North America, and they attack basically the same groups of insects that, that the Burkhanids do, caterpillars, wood-boring beetles, um, actually some bees. They, um, again, can have a very long ovipositor drilling into wood, um, and some of those are also commercially available to buy. We have another group of very much, much, much smaller parasitic hymenoptera in the superfamily Calphoidea. Um, we have over 2,000 um, species within this superfamily. These are generally much smaller wasps, about um, a quarter of a millimeter to four millimeters in size. Um, they, again, are parasitic as the larval stage. The adults feed on flowers. They really range in color. Some of them are very brightly metallic, um, green and blues, but all of them tend to be quite small. And these, uh, there's seven families that are particularly important in providing biological control services. I'm gonna show you pictures of these families on the next slide. But they're the teramalids, the calcids, inserted eulophids, mimarids, trichogrammatids, and aphalinids are all very important um, in providing biological control services. So here's some pictures of what some of those parasitoids look like. In the upper left-hand corner, we have the calcid wasp. And you'll notice that it has a really unique feature and that it has really chunky kind of hind femur legs. Um, and so if you're lucky enough to be able to see one of these um, out in your landscape and you see that really fat, chunky um, hind leg, you'll know it's a calcid wasp. The center picture is a picture of an inserted. Um, this, this example has a pretty long ovipositor. Um, the lower right hand is a picture of an acylinid. These uh, are very, very small, um, typically egg parasitoids. And then we have the teramalid in the middle. Um, they are very diverse um, in their colors, ranging from dark solid black to bright metallic bright metallic green. Um, and here is a picture of a really bright metallic green um, ter teramalid. We have about 400 species of these wasps. Um, they're one of the most diverse groups of parasitoids we have. Um, they can be both internal and external parasitoids um, and they attack a lot of different life stages. In this lower picture, we have a parasitoid laying eggs and a, a, a pupa of, a, of an insect. So it's attaching the pupal state 
attacking a pupil stage of that pest. The next group is the inserted. Um, most of the inserted are egg parasitoids. So again, a very, very small um, parasitic wasp. And they are oftentimes used in biological control. In one particular group, they've been used on our gypsy moths. Here's just some more pictures of inserted wasps. Um, you can see this is a point of paper. So this little wasp is about one millimeter in size, and it's been what we call point mounted to the tip of a piece of paper. So that really helps you, uh, gives you an idea of how small some of these wasps are. Uh, the next group of parasitoids that I really like, they're called mimerids. Um, sometimes they're also called fairy flies. Um, they're very small, um, usually less than a millimeter, and you can see they typically have very long antennae. They have very reduced wing venation, and their wings are typically very feathery, um, very, have very, very feathery looking. Um, and again, these are egg parasitoids, typically on leaf hoppers and plant hoppers. And the next group of uh, wasps are called trichogrammatids. These, again, less than one millimeter, you can see this little parasitoid on the lower picture is parasitizing an insect egg. And the top picture is a picture of a scale again, where you can see that little emergence hole, and you can see the little adult wasp next to that scale. Um, again, this group is commercially available, a lot of times used in greenhouses. I want to remind everyone that um, a lot of people don't like spiders in their landscape, but spiders are predaceous too. Um, they're generalists, so as you can see, they can sometimes attack insects we don't want them to, like monarch butterflies, um, but they also can at attack pest insects in the landscape. So some <laughs> examples of spiders we have are jumping spiders, wolf spiders, and crab spiders. Those are some of the more common ones you might find in your landscape. So here are the last couple slides. Um, I just wanted to kind of remind everyone what you can do in your backyard or your landscape to support natural enemies, those insect predators and parasitoids. Um, the first thing you can do, as we saw, not all life stages are predaceous. So some insects like the ladybug or the serpent flies or all the parasitoids, as adults, they need to feed on pollen and nectar. So incorporating flowering resources into your landscape can be really important to supporting those life stages that are not predaceous. Um, we also want to provide alternative um, hosts for these beneficial insects. So we don't want our insect population to crash in our garden. We want it to be fairly stable so we can also have a stable population of beneficial insects. We want our landscape to be in balance so we don't want too many pests, but we always need to have some insects for those natural enemies to feed on. Otherwise, their populations will also crash and then we won't have any to suppress those pest populations. When you're designing your flower garden, um, think about flowering time. So we always want to have flowering resources available from very early spring to late in the season because all these different species of predators and parasitoids are active at different times of the year. Um, think about flower shape, think about flower color, the spatial arrangements of your flower beds can be important. And if you have a flower, uh, a vegetable garden in your backyard, think about the relationship of your flowers to your garden. As, as you saw, many of those parasitoid species are quite small and they're not good at dispersing or flying. So you need to have floral resources fairly, fairly close to where you may have pests for those parasitoids to disperse to and attack. And then lastly, we want to have overwintering and nesting habitat in the landscape. So a lot of times people want to get rid of all their leaf litter and cut down all their stems at the end of the season. And this is actually really good habitat for those predators and parasitoids to be overwintering in. So please, please leave stems standing in your garden and please leave some leaf litter for these species to overwinter in so they'll be in your garden the next year when um, your pests start to emerge. Um, if you have more of a, a farm setting or you have a bigger yard, think about your perennial flower beds. Um, try not to mow or, or mow your yard as often or cut down again all those stems in those perennial flower beds. If you have a garden, 
Um, think about trying to minimize your disking because those crabbed beetles are maybe overwintering in your soil. Um, so I think, I think that's my last slide. So I'll be happy to answer any questions that you guys may have. And let me see if I can stop sharing. So I went through that. I went through those slides pretty quickly. And if, so if anyone has a question about a particular um, insect predator or parasitoid or just a general question about how to conserve them in your backyard, I'll be happy to answer any questions you guys might have. Can you hear us at all? Yes, I can hear you just fine. Okay. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you for coming. I can hear you. I can hear you okay. Me, and Jared, or Ross? <laughs> it sounds like you might be able to hear me better. Yes, I can hear you just fine. The okay. people that are speaking in the background, I can't hear them. Understood. Well, I knew I knew I had a question. Which was sure. well, yeah, well, Jared, uh, my name is Ross. Jared was thanking you for giving a really interesting presentation on the mic, and you couldn't hear it, and that's okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, my question was, what does your garden look like? Well, right now I uh, am visiting my, my family in Illinois and um, we have about 20 acres of prairie. So I'll tell you about um, the prairie we have. So we have a lot of milkweed species blooming right now. We have th uh, three species of milkweed, common milkweed, butterfly milkweed, and um, swamp milkweed. Uh, the swamp milkweed hasn't quite started blooming yet. We have pale coneflower coming on, and we have um, some black eyed Susans and some purple prairie clover that are blooming out in the prairie. So I grew up on a farm, and we have a lot of uh, what we call CRP habitat that's been restored to prairie to conserve both pollinators and uh, insect predators and parasitoids in our, in our landscape here on our farm. So that's, that's, what, that's what I'm looking at this evening. <laughs> um, thank you. I, I have a question. Um, some of the, the parasites, I, I'm, I'm sorry, the predators, I, I imagine that their uh, like um, predation methods are different, but are there kind of common um, techniques that they use? Like, you know, is it visual or are they uh, sense yeah. or? Yeah, yeah. So that's a really good question. So um, the different insect groups, I guess, two, I'll make two points. The different insect groups have different mouth parts. So if you remember that one insect I showed you with the piercing sucking mouth part, um, uh, that one will basically stab its prey and suck out its, its inside. And then we have insects that have chewing mouth parts like the crabbed beetles and the ladybird, la ladybugs. So we have different mouth parts, but then we do have different modes of, I guess, um, activity. So some will be sit and wait predators, some are active predators. Um, the spiders that I showed you at, at the very last slide, the crab spider, which was yellow, that's, uh, and you'll, you'll typically see yellow and white. Those are sit and wait spiders. The spider right next to it that had the really big eyes, that's an actively searching predator that's called a jumping spider. And it will just go, both the wolf spider and the jumping spider don't sit around, they'll actively pursue their prey. Really good question. Thank you. So it depends on, it depends on the natural enemy. Yeah, it's mode of, um, of searching down and tracking down and it's prey. Um, good question for you. Hammerhead worms, I don't know what their official name is. I'm finding a lot of them under pots. Uh, are you familiar with them at all? Should we be destroying them? Shovelhead worms. Shovelhead, is that what they are? Yeah. Shovelhead, okay. Okay, you know what? I don't, I'm not familiar with that pest, but what I will do is I will do a little searching and I will, I will try to track down an answer for you. So you said it's called hammerhead or shovelhead. And can you tell me a little bit more about it? 
So you said you're finding it under your pot. What does it look like? They're very thin. Uh, they're anywhere from quarter inch to two to three inches long. Uh, they seem oh, okay. to have wow. two kind of stripes or veins within them. And the, okay. they're typically shaped like a, like a hammerhead shark. And I believe- Oh, really? Okay. Uh, that, that's they're, helpful. They're all, okay. and they are super, super sticky. Really? Okay. Super sticky, shaped like a hammerhead shark. Okay, I'll have to do some homework. I don't know the answer to that one. I'm sorry. <laughs> I suppose if you want to send us information afterwards, we, we have a Facebook um, group sure. I can put articles to and things. Sure. So. Sounds good. Uh, there's a question over here. Okay. That's a really cool uh, question. If you live inside a city and you're dealing with an HOA who's more concerned with the aesthetics and the manicured lawns, what's a good way to sell to them the idea of me to leave the leaf litter? Me to bring in insects and these, you know, things like that instead of having the standard mode to an inch of its life. Door. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I guess I would think of starting to kind of build a business case for why it's important to, you know, not have a mowed lawn and to introduce diversity into your lawn to think about um, leaving perennial stems. So we didn't talk about pollinators, but pollinators nest in two places. They nest in the soil and they nest in the stem of plants. So pollinators are another potentially important group that can be nesting in the stems of perennial plants. So leaving those stems, not only for those natural enemies, but also for your pollinators can be a very important. So there's lots of literature out there supporting these uh, activities for, you know, why do we want to have a diverse, you know, diverse landscape or a perennial garden or why do we need to leave overwintering habitat? Um, why do we, you know, want to leave our stems standing until the next spring? And there's lots of peer reviewed scientific literature to support this. So I guess I would try to make a case based on the science um, and the literature that supports, you know, ecologically why why this is important. And I don't know if your HOA, you know, pays for, you know, uh, services to come in and control pests, but maybe you can try to make an economic argument too as well that perhaps you can save money on landscaping services um, by switching to a landscape that's going to provide more, more of those natural biological control services than having to pay for artificial pest control by having a company come in and provide those services for you. I mean, that's the whole point of, you know, trying to support these insects in your landscape is they'll provide these services for you for free. Um, you don't have to go pay for them. So those are just a couple thoughts. I, I guess I oftentimes hear about, you know, native plants being, you know, I, I of course would never ever say this, but I hear this, oh, they're tall, they're ugly. You know, you can't design a beautiful landscape using native plants, and that's not true. There's a lot of native plants that have, um, that are short, that have a habit that is, you know, compact. So you can design a landscape um, that doesn't look as kind of natural and as tall um, as a prairie would in a landscape by being thoughtful with the species you actually plant. Um, in your backyard. And there's lots of uh, resources out there that provide recommendations on what those plants are. Um, I, I've already mentioned two of my favorites, butterfly milkweed. It's a native plant. It has a bright, bright, beautiful orange flower. It only gets two to three feet high. It has um, not very, uh, does not spread. So it probably has a two to three foot spread. Purple prairie clover is another very well-behaved native plant. 
again, probably two, two to three feet in height, beautiful, beautiful, fine textured leaves and a bright purple um, flower head. So um, if, if you guys want to invite me back to talk, to, to talk about landscaping with native plants and what plants you want to pick, I'd be happy to come back and talk, talk about that another day. But hopefully those are some good tips that can maybe get you down the path of starting to make an argument or case for um, some of the landscaping practices that will, would support beneficial insects. I just want to add to that there are two local organizations I know off the top of my head that might have some support and back up that same issue with the Trees Atlanta and the Georgia Native Plant Society. Um, which, uh, and I don't know, I'm sure that I'm sure you guys have a master gardener, a local master gardener group, um, but there's also organizations called Master Naturalists and Master Gardeners, and they may be able to provide um, support, some support in that area as well. Anyone else have a question? Well, I think that's it. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bennett. It's been a pleasure having you. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to end the Zoom call? Or? So I think Jared, I'll go ahead and hop off if there's if there's nothing else for me. I think we're good. We think we're good. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay, you guys have a great evening. Thank you. You too. Bye. Bye.